holidays. Right, let's turn to four years after Grenfell. Uh, the government identified 469 buildings in England with that same dangerous cladding. How many of those have had it removed? Well, 95% of those buildings have either had the cladding removed or there are, on, are workers on site now removing it. Mm. And about 70% of them have finished the job altogether. Completions are happening literally every week. And we expect that all bar a very small number of exceptional cases that work to be finished well, by the end of the year. So 95%, if I may say so, isn't really a meaningful figure because that can simply mean somebody sticking up a sign or arriving on site. Now, the last figures well, that we've got... Well, can well, I just finish? If, if, if I could just make the point, I, I said that 70% of the buildings well, uh, right, have been too. finished and the rest will be finished barring very exceptional circumstances so, so, by so, the end of this year. So you say 70%. We've got the latest figures from the Building Safety Programme. That's the month, monthly data release for the 31st of May, not long ago. And then... Only 260 out of the 469 had been completed. The starting work had started on 173 and had not started. Nothing had happened on 33, which would suggest that 55% of the buildings with this aluminium composite cladding had not yet had it removed. No, but work is happening very fast now. So it takes time to get workers on site. But once they are, work happens quite quickly. And so we expect the work to be finished by the end of this year. So every week you'll be seeing buildings completed and I follow this data very closely and so you know I could tell you the buildings that next week we expect to be completed. It's been slow this is four years on from Grenfell and it has very direct human consequences let's just hear very briefly from one of the residents who was in Grenfell on that terrible night. As long as that cladding remains on the outside of these buildings Grenfell too will happen. That was Edward Daffin, and he says, you know, there is going to be another Grenfell as long as there is still cladding on those buildings, and there still is. For all of the building, all the people watching this programme right now who are living in those kind of buildings, can you give an absolute guarantee that they will have safe, uh, somewhere safe to live by September? Well, I know Edward well, and I've worked with him on a number of issues coming out of the Grenfell tragedy. I have huge sympathy for those people living in buildings where they're genuinely very concerned for their safety. We're working hard, we've got a very strong team handling this now. As I say, by the end of this year, we expect all but a very small number of buildings to have been completely remediated. Where they've not been remediated, it's usually for other reasons, like no one is living in the building, it's extremely difficult to remediate, perhaps it's on a seafront, for example, or it's part of a broader programme of works. So on the ACM cladding, the most dangerous form of cladding, we are really making good progress oh. now. There are other types of cladding as well on high-rise buildings, and there we've created a £5 okay. billion so, pound so, fund so to paint, get that work done quickly as well. You're a very positive picture here, but you also promised that all this so-called ACM cladding would have gone by the end of this year. Is that going to happen? I expect all the ACM cladding will be off buildings by the end of this year, as they barring a very small number of buildings, and there are exceptional reasons for those. So, well, barring a small number of buildings, so the answer is no, isn't it? It won't all be off. No, there will be buildings with ACM cladding. Well, it's a bit more complicated than you're, you're, you're portraying it, Andrew, yes, no, really. because actually some of the buildings which have ACM cladding were only discovered in the last year or so. So the buildings which we've known for some time, yes, absolutely, there are some buildings we've discovered more recently. They'll take a little bit longer. I, I'm just asking you about things you yourself have said. Let me talk about one particular building, because this is all about individual buildings. Mm -hmm. And progress does seem to a lot of people to have been very slow. This is North Point Tower in Bromley, which is one of the first to be approved for funding for recladding. And that was back in, I think, December 2019. It was and so far... Not a single pound, not a bean, not a peseta, nothing has, has gone to that building. They've been offered money, they've gone through the process, no money has come. After so long, why? Well, I know that building well and I've worked with the residents there. There are some complications on that particular building, but again, that is within the programme. We are fully funding the remediation of the dangerous cladding on that building. Uh, the residents are working with us to work through some of the associated costs that are going to be incurred. Well, but I expect that that building will also have the remediation done by the end of this year. Those residents have huge insurance premiums as a result of this, and they're having to pay day after day, week by week, 
for waking watch fire patrols all the time. Why should they have to pay for it? They shouldn't. Because, they shouldn't have to pay. So who's going to pay? Are you going to pay them for it? Well, the exchequer, the taxpayer, is now paying more than £5 billion. Pounds. That's a very large sum of money to try to help those leaseholders. But it should be the builders but they're not and the developers who should be paying for this. It is not right that either the leaseholder or the taxpayer has to step up. And I'm announcing today that we're going to change the law retrospectively to give every homeowner 15 years in which to take action against the people who built their building if there's shoddy workmanship. I wish so, we hadn't reached this point. So, I wish okay. more developers had paid up. Well, let me it. ask you about that. So people who are in buildings which are unsafe but are 20 years old get no help at all. Well, this is a huge step forward. The law as we found it was that yep. you only had six years as a homeowner to take action against the person who built your home. That often gives you less protection lots, than if you I'm bought sorry, a toaster or a fridge sure, in the shop. Lots, the of the most dangerous, lots of the most dangerous buildings are more than 15 years old. Not many are, actually. Most of the cladded buildings that we're talking about here were built in the period from 2000 to 2017 when we had the mm. Grenfell tragedy. So, so not all, I appreciate, dark? but many, the, the lion's share of the buildings that are facing yes, this particular issue will now be helped by this quite unusual okay. change in the law. So two questions. One, why should those people not be treated fairly? But also, two, all this does is it allows groups of leaseholders, tenants, to get together and take a legal case against a very, very powerful, well-funded, well-lawyered development company. Now, that is a, uh, not a level playing field. It can take years and years and years for these legal cases to come, and it's going to be very, very expensive for them. So it, it sounds much, much better than it is. Well, I don't think there's any easy way out of this situation. You're absolutely right. I want the developers, the builders, the warranty companies, the insurers to pay up. I want shoddy workmanship to be paid for by the people who did it, not by the leaseholders. That is happening in some cases. About 50% of the cost of removing the Grenfell-style cladding has been paid for by the people who put it up. We're also seeing more of the larger developers coming forward. Since I made an announcement in February right. asking them to do so, they've you... committed £500 million to do that. That's your big volume house builders. This new change in the law, I think, does put new cards in the hands of the leaseholders so they can take mm. action. The trouble is that an awful lot of this is just for the cladding. All the other safety defects uh, around fire, which have been uncovered in the course of the investigations, are not covered. I mentioned North Point Tower. Let me ask you about another building, which is Metis Tower. Uh, and that's in Sheffield. It's the Metis building. It's got 14 storeys there and 113 flats. They were accepted into the fund, but only granted £6 million of the £12 million it's going to cost to make that tower safe. Now, that means that every leaseholder in that tower is facing an average bill of £50,000, which many of them simply can't pay. Is that fair? Well, what we've done is focus taxpayers' money, £5 billion, with expert advice on the material that is most dangerous and the type of building that's highest risk. So high-rise buildings mm -hmm. with cladding. I think that's the right thing to do. Well, that's what all the experts advise us it, on. I would just make a more general well, point, Andrew, if no, I may. Well, which can, is, I want which to stay on Metis say, for well, a second. If I could just make this point, we do have to remember that most buildings in this country, including high-rise buildings, are fundamentally safe. And I don't want to see leaseholders being met with well, very high bills for works which may prove to be unnecessary. At the moment in the market, I've, we're I've, seeing what's been described by our expert advisor, okay. Dame Judith Hackett, I've, as extreme risk aversion. Okay. There is statistically well, a lower risk of fatality in a flat than in a house or a bungalow. So we've got to ensure that leaseholders are not being stung for bills for things that simply don't need to happen. And one of the big challenges okay. for us as a I've, government now I've, is to instill proportionality into this debate. Well, I mean, I've talked to people who've looked into this in great detail who think that almost all of those higher buildings are still unsafe. And this is a national... Well, that's, Andrew, not, that's not well, what well, our well, expert advisers say. Let me give you well, the statistics. No, no, no. Let, let me give you well, the statistics. No, no, let me, Last let me, year, let me give you a only point. three people, mercifully, died in fires in high-rise buildings in this country, okay. you have a much greater chance of dying in a, in a 
flat, sorry, in a, in a house or a bungalow than you do in an apartment. And so we've got to be careful okay. that we instill proportionality the, because at the end of the day, the, it's only the homeowner who will miss out because they'll end up having to pay the sorts of bills you've just described. Well, meanwhile, you know, leaseholders for absolutely no fault of their own who've bought a property in good faith are stung with bills they simply can't pay. I talked about the Metis building in Sheffield. Let's hear from one of the people who is living in that building right now. To be at work, to receive that, and then to spend the entire rest of my afternoon just dwelling on that and thinking about, where am I going to get that money from now then? How am I going to fix that problem? What am I going to do about that? It's just miserable. This situation is absolutely miserable. Now, what you said about, about people in that condition is that uh, it's unacceptable for leaseholders to have to worry about the cost of fixing historic safety defects in buildings that they did not cause. That's what you said. Mm -hmm. So why does the Building Safety Bill, which comes into the House of Commons tomorrow, so dramatically water down your pledge? It, it doesn't water down that well, pledge. What, I, what, what, I can read what, you, I can read you from your own notes. It does water down the pledge. The notes, the clause is 88 and 89. Well, with says, respect to you, have, we haven't published the bill yet, Andrew, so you're, you're reading, well, I'm reading an your, old version I'm of the bill. your explanatory note, but, and it's, we it's haven't the published policy the bill, intention Andrew. that as far as possible, as far as possible, leaseholders should not have to face unaffordable costs. That sounds gurgle, 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 well, With, with, with respect, Andrew, we haven't published the bill yet, so you're, you're reading from a... Uh, an old copy of a draft of a draft bill. We have actually changed the clause that you're referring to, but you have to wait until we publish that in the House of Commons. What we've tried to do as a government is to protect leaseholders as far as we possibly can. We don't want either the leaseholder or the exchequer, the taxpayer, many of whom are not homeowners, to be paying very large sums of money for this. We want, in the first instance, the developer to All be right. paying for this. As we have put forward £5 billion, and so the gentleman you just referred to, and who, who, who I know and have, have met, and others, will not be having to pay for any of the costs of the unsafe cladding if they live in a high-rise building. All right, Robert Jenrick, thanks very much.